Hello and welcome back to the entrance of thy words. We started last week with the Noahic covenant and we had worked our way through or up to the Noahic covenant in Genesis chapter 9. Um, last week we made some comments about uh, chapter 8 leading up to the, the actual covenant that's given in chapter 9. We got a little bit into the rainbow and some different things there. The word covenant is mentioned here in uh, chapter 9 verse 9. Uh, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, verse 15, 16, 17. So over and over again, uh, the Holy Spirit is solidifying the fact that God is making a covenant with His people, uh, with people in general here. I will look at that in a minute. But uh, like we've said for the past few weeks, when our Creator in, in, in written form, verbal form, but also here in written form, makes a covenant with his people. It's a very important thing. Um, it, when the covenant starts in verse 1 here in chapter 9, it's unconditional. God bless Noah and his sons, period. That's it. He's giving them a blessing. That some conditions come in in verse 4 where uh, the Bible says, but he says, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. So there's a conditional thing here where he tells them, just as he does again in Leviticus 17, and then again in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 15, not to consume blood, don't take blood. Uh, so there's a condition there. Uh, you back up and look at verse 1. The Bible says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, and then he gives the same command that was given to Adam early on. He says, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And then he tells them that because of what's happened now that there will be some fear uh, of them from the creation, from the creatures. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. And verse 3 and then he says, even as the green herb, have I given you all things. Now, there's also early in this covenant, there's also uh, some information that we desperately need about um, a murderer and, and what should happen there with a capital punishment. In Genesis 9, 6, while giving all this covenant information, he says, whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So we, we realize that from Genesis 5, we're in Adam's image, we're fallen creatures, but we've, there's still some part of that image of God that we were made in, obviously that we've retained, or he wouldn't have said this. Okay, so initially we're made in the image of God. Adam sins, we're now given in Genesis 5 the information that lets us know that we're after Adam, we're in his image now. And that's a fallen creature. But originally, uh, uh, we were made in God's image. So he says here, you, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. So you say, well, preacher, that's old fashioned, Old Testament, you know, it's, it's eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing. Now in the New Testament, you can't do that. <clears throat> I'm just gonna give you the references here. We're not gonna turn to these references. The Bible has a lot to say about capital punishment. Numbers 35. Numbers 35 tells you that if you, if you don't shed a man's blood who has already shed someone else's blood, they've lain in wait, they've murdered someone, if you don't take his or her life away, then you defile the land. So I, I think that's a lot of what's happened. Now, obviously, we're, our nation is in trouble. That's a lot of what's happened in our nation is that we have allowed wicked people to go free or stay in jail and feed them for the rest of their natural lives. Or we've taken people who were innocent and we've, we've uh, trumped up charges and shed their blood just like they did eventually here to the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Numbers 35 gives you that information. Romans 13, the Bible says that that, that minister there, uh, a modern-day police officer, that minister beareth not the sword in vain. So 
why is he carrying a sword? Is he carrying it just to as a part of his material? Or is he carrying it just to point at people? Or is he carrying it to use it if those people go too far or step out of line? Why do police officers carry guns? They carry those guns to use them if someone steps out of line. Don't give me the stuff about bad cops, okay? They're bad cops. They're, they're bad preachers. Uh, there's, there's, they're, bad, uh, they're bad teachers in the public school system. Does that mean that all the teachers in the public school system are bad? No, it doesn't. There's bad cab drivers. I'm sure there's some good ones, too. There's bad diesel mechanics, okay? You can't stereotype people and say, well, I know this bad cop that, you know, that murdered this guy up in Minnesota. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure. There are some bad cases. Uh, you don't take that out on, on everyone, okay, all the police officers, because this one or two or three bad cops decided to make a bad decision. Use some common sense. Uh, now, this Roman soldier bears not the sword in vain. He's to use it. I remember my grandparents talking about the fact that when they were children and you were down in, in downtown somewhere, uh, and if a police officer said stop, you stop. That's just respect for authority and for the law. You stop. And if you didn't stop, you'd get a warning shot in the air. And if you didn't stop at that point, there'd be somebody shooting in amongst you. Um, we, we have lost all respect for that office, those type people. Romans 13 talks about him bearing not the sword in vain because he, is, he can execute judgment and uh, he can, he's a minister of God. Acts 25, again, New Testament. Paul says in Acts 25, if he's done anything worthy of death, then he would refuse not to die capital punishment. He says in the New Testament, as late as Acts 25, if you find that I've done something that merits capital punishment, I won't refuse to die because it's right. 1 Kings 20, 35, Ezra 7, 26, 1 Samuel chapter 15, Ecclesiastes 8, 11, Jeremiah 48, 10, Genesis 31, 32, Numbers 15, Deuteronomy 19, Isaiah 33, and the list goes on and on and on. The Word of God has a lot to say about capital punishment. Now, you move on into this thing, and he gets to talking about this uh, bow that he'll set. Now, I want you to notice that these covenants that we're talking about are not old-fashioned covenants that were given to this individual group of people um, 4,000 years ago, but they're null and void now. They, they don't, they're not in effect now. That's not true. These covenants that God made, they are in effect right now, okay? Uh, <clears throat> look at verse 11. Again, he says in verse 9, And I, behold, I will establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, after you. And with every living creature, in verse 10, that is with you, of the fowl, the cattle, every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Now, verse 11, And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. So we talked last time about the fact that we know that that was a universal flood or else God would have broken his promise because there have been local floods. There's local flooding now going on right now in certain parts of the earth, but there's never been another universal flood. Verse 12, and God said, this is a token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations at the end of verse 12. So these covenants are not things that he made with this group of people. Then once they pass on out of here, that covenant's no good anymore. The, the information that he's about to give us in chapter 9 here is still in force today. These covenants are very, very important, and they're very enlightening for us in our day and age. <clears throat> Notice that he says in verse 16, well, verse 15, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. 
and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Okay, so again, this covenant is not just with Noah, his children. It starts here with Noah and his children and grandchildren. But he mentions over and over again in the passage, all flesh in verse 11. All flesh in verse 15. All flesh in verse 16. He says for perpetual generations in verse 12. So the information that you're going to get here is up to date and it will help you to discern the, the signs of the times and what's going on right now, some of the things that are going on right now, these covenants will help you and I to understand some of those things because God said that some of these things would take place way back here in Genesis 9 with the covenant that he made with Noah, his children, and grandchildren. We're going to stop right there and we'll pick it up and, and hopefully finish this Noahic covenant next week. Hope you've enjoyed this. Good day and God bless you.